Hello. Hello. Good morning, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. So before we begin, uh, thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Jenny Herwood and I'm the Communications Officer at the Partnership for Economic Policy. And I would like to briefly share some housekeeping points. So uh, we have French interpretation available today. To listen in your preferred language, click on your language at the bottom of your screen and select the language you wish to hear. You can also change the language of the interface at the top of your screen. We invite you to ask questions to our panelists at any time during this event. Please use the ask a question um, space on the right um, of your screen to submit your questions. The panelists will answer these questions after the main discussion. You are free to use the general chat box to communicate to all participants, but please note we may miss any questions if they are not submitted via the ask a question function. Anything shared in the general and ask a question spaces can be machine translated into your selected language. Hover your cursor over the text to see the option to translate it. Please keep in mind that this is a public session Please be courteous and remain on topic. If you are having any technical difficulties, you can click the question mark on the bottom left of your screen to contact tech support. Please be aware that we are recording this event and we'll share it on our YouTube channel and website. With that out of the way, I am very pleased to hand over to our moderator for today. We have Lucas Ronconi, Professor of Economics at the Universidad de Buenos Aires and a Research Fellow at PET and ISA. Thank you, Lucas. Thank you, Jenny. What a pleasure to be part of, of, of this panel. Let me start introducing the PEP Core Initiative. The PEPCO initiative includes 11 country studies in all the developing world, in Africa, in Asia, and in Latin America. Early on, after the COVID crisis pandemic start, early on, PEP and CORE supported researchers in order to inform policies to deal with the COVID crisis. So enough time went through, we, we learned a lot of lessons and we are having these panels in order to learn about what, what lessons we got from, from this experience. In particular, the three projects that, we, that will be discussed today used computable general equilibrium models to conduct their simulations. And, and they were one aspect that we want to emphasize that they collaborated with policymakers the, 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 their engagement with policymakers was particularly successful. That's one, one aspect what we, we want to emphasize. So let me, let me uh, uh, go ahead and, and introduce uh, uh, our panelists. Uh, let me start with uh, Dr. Saira Ahmed. Um, she's the Director of Sustainability and Environment at the Capital University of Science and Technology in, in Pakistan. Um, we also have Professor Adiola Adeni Kinju. He's a professor of economics and director of the Center for Petroleum, Energy, Economics and Law at the University of Ibadan in Nigeria. And finally, we have Professor Albert Makochekanwa. Uh, he's professor of economics and chair of the Department of Economics at the University of, of Zimbabwe. Well, what a, a, what a pleasure to have this, this group of panelists to discuss the issue that we will focus today, which is on the policy implications on the response to the COVID crisis, something that, that we have to deal with. 
So I will ask a series of questions to our panelists. Please try to be brief in, in, your, in your response. And we also encourage the audience to ask their own questions to the panelists using the ask a question section on the chat area at your right, at the right of your screen. So let me go ahead and, and let me start with the, with the first question. So um, could you please briefly explain how and why you selected the focus of your research project? Was this linked to specific policy needs in your country? Yes, Aida. Yeah. Oh, okay. uh, good afternoon, and thank you. Um, let, let me just provide a brief uh, background. Uh, prior to COVID-19, Nigeria economy was already confronted by significant headwinds, uncertainties, and vulner vulnerabilities. Uh, this includes, uh, number one, Nigeria was just recovering from a recession in 2016, and the economic growth at that time was very tepid. Uh, in 2017, the economy grew by 0.82%. Uh, it increased to 1.97% in 2018. And in 2019, just before COVID came in, uh, the economic growth was 2.27%. Was the economy was also confronted by issues related to high unemployment, especially the youth unemployment, which, which was about 40%, and high poverty rate. In addition, there was insecurity uh, in the fuel producing region, especially in the northern part of the country. There was a lot of you know, insecurity around there. There was also high fiscal dependence on oil and gas sector. The oil and gas sector accounted for about 50%, uh, over 50% of government revenue and over 80% of foreign exchange you know, uh, in the economy. And also there was limited fiscal space you know, as deficit expenditure ratio was about 33.6% in 2019. So when uh, COVID came in, the policymakers were very concerned. They were very concerned about three key issues. One, how to finance the rescue plan uh, for the economy in order to mitigate the negative shock uh, from COVID-19. So the first thing was, how do we finance it? Do we do, we do it through deficit financing? Do we, you know, do we look for grants and so on and so forth? The second question that the policymakers were interested in was what were the instruments, the best instruments of intervention to use, uh, you know, and the relative effectiveness of these various instruments that were available to them. Uh, so throughout the the interactions, you know, the period of this of, of this of the study, the policymakers were regularly try to find out the relative effectiveness of the instruments that they have deployed, which one was working, which, you know, how effective were those instruments. And they were also concerned that in the long term, apart from rescuing the economy, how do we restore the economy back to growth? That was another question that they were interested in. So um, in our case, from the conception of the study to the completion, we were fully engaged with the policymakers. In fact, we constituted a team of advisors. And in that advisory team, uh, we had uh, the current chief economic advisor to the president, 
the special advisor to the Minister of Finance on Economy, the special advisor to the Vice President on Economy, the Director of Macro in the, in the Ministry of Budget, and you know, and you know, certain directors in, in the Central Bank of Nigeria. So, so in other words, this project was funded, uh, the conception, the implementation was actually through the interactions we had uh, with, with this policy maker. That's okay. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Okay, great. I'll, I'll go on then. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Uh, I was muted earlier. Um, and thank you for the technical assistance from voice box. Okay. So, uh, yes, uh, this is a very pertinent question that how did we select the focus of our research? Um, and um, definitely um, as, as uh, COVID hit, uh, the world and um, COVID hit Pakistan, uh, national and um, subnational governments uh, came forward with tax reliefs for individuals and private enterprises. And the federal government was keen to study how um, tax policy and administration can be a catalyst in a post pandemic recovery. Um, also, um, uh, development partners supporting the government were aiming to uh, design a comprehensive response, uh, which of course included changes to tax policy. Um, however, implementing any tax relief was never easy as Pakistan um, has been um, and is under uh, a program of a structural adjustment uh, of the International Monetary Fund. When a uh, pandemic came about, of course, that was also uh, in place. Um, thus, a tax relief um, options um, had to be aligned uh, and had to be designed not only to uh, ease difficulties of uh, individual taxpayers, um, the small and medium uh, sized firms, um, trading firms, but also to um, help uh, government minimize revenue losses. So this is exactly what we wanted to study, and we wanted to see that how uh, policy, how important it was for policy makers to know which tax policy changes have worked best or would work best. And our study assess, uh, tried to assess um, how far tax policy measures uh, could perform during the first wave of the pandemic, of, uh, of course, and, it, and the subsequent waves uh, in order to help broaden government's um, understanding uh, regarding um, the design of a fair and just tax code. And uh, it was expected that the findings uh, would lend insight uh, for future uh, design of uh, tax policy, fiscal policy amid uh, emergency times. Thank you. Thank you, Saida. Thank you very much. Albert, the mic is yours. Okay, absolutely, no worries. Uh, so um, uh, let's move to, to, to the next question. And um, could you could you please describe um, the the fiscal policy dimension of the crisis? Uh, how has the government strategy evolved since the beginning of the of the COVID crisis? Uh, uh, thank you very much. Um, as I indicated earlier on, uh, by the time COVID struck in 2020, uh, the fiscal space was very narrow. Uh, the government was confronted with the issue of fiscal, you know, um, a very narrow fiscal space. Uh, let, let, let me just give you some data. Uh, for instance, the revenue GDP ratio was around 5%, which was one of the, which was one of the lowest in the world. 
the expenditure, government expenditure GDP ratio was around 7%. Okay, again, one of the lowest in the world. And um, the budget, you know, before 2020, before the inception of, uh, before COVID-19 came, was basically financed through deficit, was mainly deficit, you know, uh, financed. Uh, in fact, by 2019, um, the uh, debt, debt service ratio to GDP was almost was over eighty percent. So for every one dollar we collect in revenue, we spend you know eighty cents to service our debt. So the economy was you know, was seriously uh, challenged. So in response, uh, the government put in place a plan, what they call the uh, economic Sustain sustainability plan, uh, which was designed to rescue. The economy and restore growth. It was around 2.3 trillion naira. Now, unlike many other countries in Africa, the government had to rely on the central bank to play a very active role, albeit quasi fiscal role. So, out of the 2.3 trillion naira, the central bank was to bring about what was, was to contribute 1.8 trillion, and the, 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 the federal government brought about 500 billion. Okay, so the central bank played a very active role in terms of intervention, you know, and that you know that came with a lot of criticisms, you know, from uh, from you know uh, from non-government uh, uh, sources because the idea was government should not the central bank should not be you know be intervening directly in the economy, you know. But the good thing, I mean, one thing about the central bank intervention was that it came through loans through subsidized loans, okay? They were not grants, okay? So, um, you know, they, they, they provided what you call a targeted credit facility of about uh, 250 billion, which is short-term credit to households, you know, who were affected. They also provided credit, subsidized credit, single digit to the risk sector of the economy. Um, but the government also came in, uh, like I said, the government is a little bit constrained, so, it played a very limited role. And one of the things that government did immediately was to revise the 2020 budget. It realized that many of the, uh, the revenue assumption, assumptions were not realistic. Okay, before the budget, you know, by the time the budget was prepared, oil price was very high, you know. Uh, you know so the budget was prepared on the basis of $56 per barrel. But within two months after COVID-19, you know, the price of oil crashed by almost 60%. So government had to revise the budget to make it more realistic. So they revised the budget on the price of petrol from $60 per barrel, $56 per barrel to $26 per barrel without reducing the expenditure correspondingly, okay? So that led to ballooning of, 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 of the deficit. So a lot of deficit, you know, deficit ramped up in order to uh, reflate the economy. And also, in addition to that, uh, the government also had to, you know, embark on diet fiscal, you know, diet cash transfers. But one of the limitations we had was that there was no register, national register of, of, of the poor. So the, the government had to adopt, you know, conventional methods, you know, going to the marketplace, for instance, you know, and distributing cash, you know, to, to market people. Um, so, you know, people raise issues around you know, the effectiveness of such kind of uh, intervention, okay? Uh, it also raises the problem of accountability. How do you account for those who actually benefited from that? So one of the issues that came out strongly was that there was to be a need uh, to actually have a register uh, of the poor and the vulnerables so that when, to, you know, when uh, uh, you have, you know, uh, problems, you know, uh, shocks like COVID-19, you have a way of addressing them. One of the things that government also did quickly uh, was also to the redirect expenditure of government, you know, towards you know uh, uh, human capital development and national security. Right. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so yes, um, I just want to add uh, to my previous question. Um, I, because we need to um, clearly address the stakeholders. So um, I 
I wanted to mention that we were closely working with the uh, Ministry of Planning and Development, the Ministry of Commerce, and the Federal Board of Revenue. Uh, and all these um, uh, workings were greatly beneficial. And um, an iterative consultant consultation process was kept with um, uh, along with our four school persons and their persons, um, their the counterparts from their sides, and we were informed regarding uh, our findings at different stages of the project. They were informed by us, and similarly, um, the feedback was a feedback loop was developed. So coming back to your question, um, yes, the government um, was taken uh, by surprise. Definitely COVID was a situation where uh, governments were struggling very hard and it was so in South Asia as well. Um, however, Pakistani government responded very um, promptly and very responsibly. Um, during the first lockdown, uh, we saw that the government, uh, through its SAS income support program, was able to transfer uh, 12,000 rupees uh, per household, which was like a huge help. And um, definitely there were issues of accountability, just like um, the professor just mentioned. Uh, but the government went uh, forward with it and did not stop. And uh, effectively, through the uh, national um, uh, documented uh, documentation uh, center, uh, which is Nadra, they were able to allow um, households, they were able to assess households and transfer households rupees 12,000 um, for um, that very moment of emergency. Because of course, people were home, they were not working, and um, uh, form, informal jobs, of course, were hit the hardest and um, the small and medium enterprises as well. Uh, apart from that, the government also um, initiated this um, plan to delay, uh, to provide a delay to uh, businesses, uh, to, to be the, they allowed them to postpone their utility bills by three months, which was a huge thing by the central bank. And the central bank allowed this um, via the banks. And uh, not only that, the banks were able also asked to give special uh, credit facility to small and medium um, businesses. So yes, the government uh, did respond um, promptly uh, via uh, its central bank and uh, the extended lockdown obviously had its impact uh, on the job insecurity and unemployment, as I just mentioned. And um, of course, the, the, the uh, efforts were all um, focused towards mitigating the health impact. Uh, but of course, uh, this also resulted in public resentment towards disease mitigation measures. Uh, people did not want that the government should enforce uh, a lockdown. Um, however, since it, they were, the global situation was such um, and uh, there was pressure from the health sector to actually impose the lockdown, so the government went forward with it. And um, during the pandemic, um, it was seen that um, the uh, medium and small uh, enterprises complained of their uh, inability to bear the high overhead fixed costs. Uh, of course, fixed costs are something that the government cannot help with. So you have to pay the rent, you have to pay your fixed uh, staff, your permanent staff. Um, and uh, this was actually because of the reduced availability of working capital in the short term. Um, so the government did come forward um, uh, also uh, with a time-bound energy subsidy, whereby electricity rates were rationalized, um, uh, as I just mentioned earlier. And lately, there were also voices um, within the government, uh, including Ministry of Commerce, uh, that there could have been the, the subsidies also could have been misused. But then again, um, the, everything was happening in so, so much of, um, um, I wouldn't call it... Um, haphazard, but I would still say that the, the speed of uh, the reform was so uh, fast that uh, there were, I, I think the, it wasn't possible to have accountability checks in place. Uh, so of course, in view of the above mentioned, uh, what I've just mentioned, uh, the overarching objective was uh, to help tar uh, target firms for such subsidies and th their concerns were also targeted. They were allowed exemptions uh, in some way or the other. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Adiola and, and Saira. It is quite interesting uh, that 
We might think that during the initial year of the COVID crisis, the incentives of researchers and policymakers were somehow aligned. Aligned in the following sense that policymakers usually like to expand aggregate demand, to have a, 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 a more a fiscal expenditure or lower taxes or to expand the monetary supply. And economists, we know when there is a negative shock, that's the right way, that's the, the right thing to do. Now, uh, so incentives were aligned in the past. Now we have a fiscal challenge ahead. So, and uh, so governments will have to deal with this, with the current situation and with all the fiscal challenges ahead. So I would I will like you to, I would like to know your thoughts uh, about whether your findings and your policy recommendations about how to deal with the, the current challenges and the future fiscal challenges, uh, whether you have discussed with this with policymakers and whether policymakers are taking your policy recommendations uh, uh, into account. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, let me answer this in two ways. Uh, first, let me um, mention some of the recommendations from our study. And then uh, I also show that some of these recommendations, you know, have somehow uh, directly or indirectly influenced government policies, uh, you know, um, uh, with respect to the fiscal um, uh, approach that government uh, has taken uh, in when during and maybe post COVID uh, 19. Now, what, what are the key findings that came out from my studies? And like I mentioned earlier on, at every point we interacted with, you know, with key senior officials, you know, to let them know, you know, what our findings were and what are the policy implications of those findings. Uh, so, so some of the findings recommendations from our study are as follows. One, that the pandemic uh, had a disproportionate impact on the informal non-agricultural sector uh, where women are overrepresented. And that this implies that a need to actually um, enhance the effectiveness of vaccination uh, so that uh, you know this negative impact on the on, on the on, on the women uh, can you know can be addressed uh, we also argued uh, we also showed that domestic resource mobilization uh, is crucial uh, if government were to continue, to maintain the pace of expenditure that, you know, that, that they had. You know, uh, the expenditure was growing faster than revenue, and therefore if government were to maintain that level of expenditure, they must find a way of you know, uh, enhancing domestic resource mobilization. Um, three, that in looking at the expenditure switching and expenditure cuts, that is important that government also take into account the adverse effects on the vulnerable groups. So if government were to go to reduce expenditure or to switch expenditure, it's very important that the impact of that on the vulnerable groups be considered. So which sector and which groups are, where are you cutting expenditure? That, that was very important. We also found out that yes, government interventions were very important, you know, and they succeeded in mitigating the negative effects of the shock, but the sources of expenditure finance was very important, okay? So the implication of how you finance that expenditure uh, matters for growth and for long-term employment, you know? So, so, um, so simply borrowing deficit financing, yes, in the short term, would, would be good, but in the middle long term, you know, they have implications on 
the fiscal framework of the of, of the you know um, uh, little deterioration of uh, the fiscal framework, uh, with net you know with uh, negative effects on employment, on poverty, uh, and long term economic growth. So so in other words, it was very clear that what government was doing was good, but it was not sustainable without finding a way of addressing the you know uh, income uh, the, the you know the income gap. So how has government responded to that? Now, if you look at the budget of 2021 and 2022, the government now is making deliberate efforts to reduce dependence on oil-related sources of, you know, of financing the budget. Uh, so in 2021, instead of the 50 or 60% dependence on oil, government actually reduced its dependence to 30%. Oil was to account for just 30% of, 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 of uh, government revenue instead of you know, the 60%, 70%. Uh, though that was not achieved, but, but gradually government not realizes that we can no longer depend on oil, you know, uh, that you know, they have to uh, re, you know, um, restructure revenue away from oil you know, dependence on oil. Second, the government also launched the Strategic Revenue Growth Initiative strategic growth, revenue growth initiative. One, which was to boost domestic resource mobilization. Okay, you know, our VAT was increased from 5%, VAT rate was increased from 5% to 7.5%. We used to have the lowest, 75%, you know, VAT. Now it was increased to 7.5%. The subsidy on electricity was reduced. It also allowed the government at that time to try to take away subsidy from oil. Because the price of oil, you know, crashed, and therefore government tried to tie domestic price of oil to, you know, to the international price. But unfortunately, when the price of oil started to rise, the government does did not have the lever, did not have the boldness to continue to, 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 to adjust domestic price of, of oil in tandem. So we are back to subsidy in oil. But you know, uh, in, in recent time, non-oil, uh, non-oil related sources are contributing significantly now more than the way uh, to, 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 to government revenue. The another thing that, you know, that I also thought uh, government has done, which was also to some extent influenced by, 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 by our study, was the financing of, you know, of um, uh, community resources to vaccination. We showed that, you know, in our study that, look, Vaccination is very is, is 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 the most important strategy in our view to actually restore growth, okay, and uh, and ensure that um, uh, the gender gap was not widening, okay. So government account, you know, actually spent some money, allocated some money in the budget specifically towards acquiring you know vaccines and ensuring that you know Nigerians you know also get those vaccination you know, to get, get those you know get vaccinated. And also, finally, that now uh, part of what has also come out now is that it is government and restructure and uh, refocus expenditure uh, to, uh, to human capital development. Health and education now rank next to national security. Uh, that, that wasn't the case before. I mean, but now it has realized that look, to take care of the vulnerables, okay? And to, you know, to be able to prepare, you know, as it's with. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that was very insightful, uh, Professor Adiola. Um, so, yes, um, at the start of the first wave, uh, the uh, government uh, of Pakistan moved to reduce the customs and other duties on import of food and agriculture sector inputs. Uh, this reduction was uh, to the tune of 2% aimed at stabilizing local prices, which uh, had seen a hike due to supply chain disruptions in turn, um, which further strengthened uh, market speculation. Um, so supply chains disruptions were, of course, they were there. And then as part of the federal and provincial budget uh, for fiscal year uh, 2020 uh, 21 the government also relaxed the income tax rates uh, for agriculture 
um, and selected food subsectors by 3%. So this measure was aimed at providing a necessary relief to farmers that were facing cash flow difficulties. Um, ensuring availability of savings with farmers was, of course, very essential so that they could uh, afford the next uh, season's inputs uh, because, of course, they had to buy inputs. And, and this, these were, of course, necessary also to maintain agricultural production and yield and overall food security objectives, um, not just in urban Pakistan, but also in rural Pakistan. Um, and some changes were also made to a general sales tax on goods. Uh, most notable from our point of view include a reduction in GST rate for large-scale manufacturing sectors by 3.5%. Uh, for food processing sector and small-scale manufacturing, we, have, uh, we saw um, almost a 5% reduction in GST. And the GST um, on services, which is the GSTS, uh, it was is basically the domain of provincial governments. They uh, set that, and all provinces reduced the standard rate of GSTS, and the economy-wide average reduction in GSTS is esti was was estimated at um, three percent. And the services, of course, which faced the standard rate, among others, included IT sector, ICT, and freelancing, which witnessed an increase in demand during the pandemic time because people were preferring working uh, uh, for remote jobs. And remote jobs really increased. Um, so based on the findings, um, our findings uh, of our study, uh, we were able to, uh, to um, discuss uh, them very well in our consultative uh, sessions uh, before um, the federal budget. And we were pleased that they influenced the federal budget um, in um, quite a few ways. Uh, so the first uh, was uh, that the Federal uh, Board of Revenue uh, revisited the design of indirect taxes in light of our study. And um, it also saw that if relief, provi uh, relief was provided during the first wave of COVID-19, it needed to be extended to the next year. So, of course, the, the, same, the same relief um, policies, they were extended. Uh, up till the next fiscal year. And the ultimate decision was indeed to continue with the tax relief and keep the tax um, regime predictable. Uh, because given the potential to kickstart economic growth and job creation, uh, it's very uh, important to keep tax regimes predictable. Um, secondly, uh, the targeted uh, subsidies program for agriculture uh, was introduced, and um, I'm happy to say that this was based on our PEP-supported study simulations, and a farmer support card was launched to improve uh, targeting uh, of this uh, program. Uh, then thirdly, I would add that um, the trade taxes and tariffs at the import stage were revised by the National Tariff Commission. Uh, tariffs, of course, on imports and intermediate goods were also further reduced, uh, as we saw uh, during the pandemic in Pakistan. It was, uh, it was seen that they were reduced. Uh, and, of course, um, this translated in uh, increased industrial competitiveness. So thank you. That's all from my side. Thank you. When, when, when we talk about crisis, we always want to see the positive side and, and we always try to see if there are some, if crisis brings some opportunities. You already touched a little bit on this, but so I would, I would like you uh, uh, to ask uh, whether you think that uh, there are lessons uh, brought by the crisis that provide opportunities particularly to improve fiscal policy management and fiscal policy management with a particular concern on, on, on the most vulnerable, to make sure that the most vulnerable are, are, are not those who suffer the most. Thank you. 
Uh, thank you very much. Um, yes, I, I, I think there are a number of opportunities that uh, came up uh, following the the, uh, the spread with COVID nineteen, uh, fiscal management and response. Um, one, I, I think the government realized that it's very important now to have a national root social register. Um, you know, that will enable you to target the poor more directly. Okay. Um, efforts were made initially to have this register, but it was not a it was not comprehensive, it was not, you know, um, uh, it was not comprehensive. You know. uh, but now, uh, you know, government saw the gap that the existing method of just simply distributing money, you know, uh, it doesn't really make too much sense. Uh, so one of the things that came out is that a national social register has been developed, a you know, comprehensive one that will cut across uh, the entire, uh, uh, entire country. Two is that uh, the president came out strongly uh, that um, uh, that is not a national priority of his government to lift 100 million Nigerians out of poverty. Okay? You know, so, government says it's a national priority that must 100 million people must be lifted out of poverty. Now, that has influenced now the way budgeting is, you know, the national budgets and even the five year bill term uh, national development plan. Uh, the government is developing uh, the five year medium national development plan 2021 to 2025. Okay. And uh, 2025. Six to twenty thirty, uh, and this priority of taking hundred million people out of poverty as is, is one of what one of the uh, core core objectives or national goal uh, in the budget and and, and the development plan, uh, and, and so that is also coming from the experience, uh, in my view, of of, of COVID nineteen, uh, the impact it had, uh, women. Special focus on women, you know, and the vulnerable. I mean, government is now conscientized in a way that you know budgeting, you know, and national plan must really take care of the poor and especially the women. Uh, so, so where there's a ministry now that is actually very you know that is devoted to doing that. So, um, the central bank. It's played a very important role in intervention in the economy and you know to complement the effort of the fiscal side. And efforts are being placed directly on, on, on those expenditure that would uh, promote growth, that will reduce poverty, and that will generate employment. Okay, these are lessons that we learn, you know, uh, from COVID-19 and if, you know the you know the outcome of uh, of that on the economy. How do you ensure that you tackle poverty? How do you ensure that you create employment? And how do you ensure that you do all of that in a context that in a fiscal stable, fiscal constant way uh, that will ensure growth? So um, also let me also quickly mention that now government is also focusing on the use of non-budget options to finance capital project. Non, not budget, you know, options. You know, um, in other words, government is trying to promote the public-private partnership as one way of, you know, shifting some of the current expenditure, you know, uh, away from the budget. Thank you. Uh, right. Um, so our findings discussed uh, these uh, concerns very well. And uh, of course, these are valid concerns that how um, uh, you can improve fiscal policy management uh, to help the most vulnerable. So um, I would say that um, our findings discussed um, above uh, the, these, these findings um, sorry, these uh, observations, which uh, contributed to better um, design of uh, tax policy response uh, during the emergency time. So first of all, the fiscal policy changes uh, that were designed for manufacturing sector, uh, it was seen that they ho uh, offered the highest gains in real GDP and uh, the reduction in consumer prices as well. So the tax relief provided to the manufacturing se sector also uh, 
uh, meets uh, almost all the evaluation criteria with which uh, through which we put our um, initiatives. Uh, then secondly, uh, the government introduced uh, Right in the beginning, the government introduced a special package for the construction industry. You see, the construction industry is one of the major employers of uh, informal and unskilled labor. And uh, uh, it was a huge uh, incentive to give a boost, especially in, in lockdown times, uh, to the construction industry. And it was appreciated uh, uh, very well by uh, the uh, economist uh, circles. Um, secondly, there was relief for services um, sector, uh, which was also very important given its largest share in GDP and fixed investment gains were highest uh, once uh, subsectors in this area received uh, tax rate reductions. Uh, thirdly, um, I would also say that fiscal responses le led to an increase in exports. However, the impact, of course, on net exports um, uh, or I should say the terms of trade def uh, deferred. Uh, so for example, while a reduction in indirect taxes uh, led to higher level of uh, manufacturing, uh, manufactured imports, uh, of course, but this was accompanied by an even higher level of import demand in the sector. Um, and uh, finally, uh, we uh, do see that overall um, uh, consumption, especially food consumption inequalities um, expanded to some extent uh, because while all household uh, households saw increase in their consumption levels, um, these gains were relatively less for poor households. Uh, so we noted that gains in wages for skilled workers were relatively uh, more than unskilled uh, workers. Uh, thank you. Thank you. We move to, to the last question and then we, uh, um, we, we will go to the, to the questions asked by, by the audience. So, so let me ask you, what kind of evidence is now needed to inform decision making related to the fiscal challenges of, of the COVID crisis? Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Um, yeah, in, in my view, there are a few things that uh, remain, you know, maybe controversial and, uh, you know, maybe research may be useful in providing the way forward. Uh, one is the, what should be the role of the central bank in the fiscal, you know, in the kind of crisis that COVID-19 presented. Um, among government officials, you know, the executive, even the legislature, that's even public, you know, uh, people's or well, the opinion that uh, the central bank apart from the responsibility of monitoring and you know, price stability to play a more active role, uh, you know, uh, you know, more fiscally, quasi fiscal intervention you know, uh, in the economy. And, and that continues to generate uh, controversy. Whether those kind of interventions should be through the MDAs, the ministries, you know, departments and agencies of government, instead of, you know, those kind of uh, diet transfer, you know, income transfer and some of these other interventions in the real sector of the economy. Two, uh, the, the government still want to be, officials are still very interested in knowing the the various interventions, the specific contributions, you know, of those various interventions, tax reduction, you know, uh, job, you know, job creation, uh, 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 public uh, public works intervention, uh, you know, uh, reduction in uh, uh, in, 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 in some of the, you know. Uh, the, you know, taxes, you know, paid by the uh, small, medium time enterprises. So that, that, that's still some question as to, you know, the relative effectiveness of these of these various interventions, you know, so as a lesson for the future. 
Yeah. Then the other thing that is also quite, uh, again, you know, um, in some sense uh, controversial is the the the, the trade-off between aggressive revenue generation and the efficiency cost of those of those of, of, of those uh, uh, activity, you know, those revenue generation measures. For instance, um, you know, the government is now asking the the customs. You know, you know, you now have targets for customs, you know, to achieve in terms of revenue generation. Now, that will compromise, you know, the trade facilitation objective of, 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 of the customs. Okay, so so there's some of these content, you know, contest, you know, uh, between the various objectives. Of All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so now I would say that now to inform the decision making um, related to fiscal challenges, the government needs to uh, perform sensitivity analysis around what specific relief will be more important uh, for those around the poverty line. So should we provide relief in electricity prices or should we provide relief in food prices? Um, then secondly, how should this relief be designed? Should it be in the form of lowering tax rate, for example, um, an increase in subsidy amount? And then um, finally, uh, if this is the subsidy amount, then how would this subsidy be financed, right? Uh, so would you be taking debt or would you be increasing some um, specific tax rate uh, or would you be cutting some other expense uh, let's say, to subsidize electricity or food prices. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me, let me read some of the questions asked by, by our audience. Let me start uh, by a question by Caleb Adelowo. Actually, there are two questions in one. One is, uh, what efforts are being made by your government to improve social security systems now and in the future? And uh, the second part of the question is, there have been several plans and failures of implementation. What and how is the current plan uh, uh, why is different from the previous one? Uh, perhaps, uh, uh, I don't know if Caleb had the Nigeria case in mind, or but, but anyway, I will, I will invite both of you uh, to answer to both these questions or to one of those, those questions, and then I, then I will move to, to the next one. So, so um, what efforts have we made to improve social security system? Well, I mean, let, let me say that um, we don't really have a formal system of, you know, social security uh, in Nigeria, um, and that's very unfortunate. Uh, you know, yes, we have pension scheme, but those are national pressure system, but that's basically for those who are employed in the formal system. A lot of Nigerians are in the formal sector, okay? And really, uh, we don't have any formal framework to actually take care of these, or, or, or these poor people. Um, that is still a lacuna. I, I mean, that, that gap is still there uh, in spite of COVID. And, and, and that's why I said, the, you know, one of the things that the government is trying to do is to build all this register, okay? And hopefully, you know, through this social register, uh, you know, government can, you know, uh, especially when uh, it decides, for instance, to remove subsidy uh, from fuel, uh, it will provide an opportunity to either do a direct cash transfers uh, to those households in order to mitigate, you know, the negative implications of that. So, um, 
the social security that is that exists now, in my view, is what we do at a formal level. Okay, maybe monthly, you know, I send money to my parents or to my to those you know those who are dependent on me. But there's no formal system. There's no formal structure in place. Uh, Yes, thank you very much. Um, that's a very pertinent question, uh, especially because the government is uh, trying to improve the social security system, uh, not just now, but previously as well. In the past governments, uh, in the past time, we have seen that uh, previous governments have designed um, one of South Asia's biggest uh, so it's a income support program by the name of Benazir Income Support Program, and now it is called the SAS program. Uh, but of course, uh, I feel the challenge is uh, more because there, we need to work on documentation of the economy. So there is still a lot of work that's needed on that side. Uh, unless the economy is documented, there's so much of informal work going on. There's cottage industry, people are working from their houses. There still needs to be more uh, work done on that. And the second question, uh, which was, um, the failures in implementation. Yes, of course, the failure in implementation is there. Uh, definitely it arises uh, because of weak documentation. Uh, we still don't have so many industries um, in the tax net and uh, we need to broaden the tax base. Uh, and this has been there in the past as well. And uh, the failure I would say is partly due to the corruption as well, uh, which goes on uh, at the lower levels. Um, and the, the current government is uh, quite uh, focused on uh, its um, um, crackdown on corruption. So it's working uh, very uh, well in close al alignment with the National Accountability Bureau. Uh, so we see that civil servants and um, officers are now under uh, quite a lot of scrutiny and uh, which is of course uh, very important because unless there's accountability, I don't see any program being a success. Thank you. Thank you. We have a, a number of very good questions coming. So what I'm going to do is to read the three or four of them. And then at the other side, you can pick up on those where, where you feel you have a, a, a more interesting to, uh, things to, to say about that. So Adem Feto asks, how can we relate the tax and fiscal policy measure with the digitalization of the economy? Uh, during the COVID pandemic, quite, quite an important issue. Um, Aviola VA is asking, what is the, the optimal strategy to reduce the impact of public debt incurred during the COVID crisis? Another, uh, of course, uh, uh, quite important issue. Uh, David Tresale asks, what do you suggest are effective tools or instruments for intervention in respect to fiscal policy for the future? And finally, a question again by, by, by Aviola. Has any studies on the impact evaluation of total fuel subsidy removal been considered by Nigerian government being conducted? And if yes, well, what are the, the, the possible of welfare deterioration? So you can, you, can, you can choose to answer partially any of these four questions. Adiola. Uh, th you know, thank you. This uh these are very, very interesting questions. Um, well, let me just uh, provide some um, responses to, to some of them. Um, I, I think the government is trying to leverage on, 
on the dig, you know, uh, digitalization uh, as a framework to actually enhance uh, tax collection in the country. Um, you know, mental problem that we have in Nigeria, I mean, we have a lot of very rich people, very, very wealthy individuals, you know, but they don't pay taxes. So tax evasion is very high. Okay, tax avoidance, tax evasion is extremely very high. Okay, people don't declare their incomes, they do projects, uh, they get a lot of money, you know, from those people, a lot of, you know, profits, and yet they don't declare them. They don't report them or they collude with tax officials. Now with the power of digitization, those processes are now being digitized. The, process, the whole process is now being, you know, uh, put in a way that, you know, in the offices of uh, the Federal Inland Revenue, they can actually see movements, you know, projects that are being done, contracts that are awarded, you know, the, the account of income that comes to your account, they have linked up with the banks. So, you know, they have the BVN verification number. So they're able to see all the accounts, what is going on in the various accounts. And so they are not depending on you to tell them how much you have earned. They can actually see how much you've earned. And so they tell you the tax you should pay. Okay, so digitization is actually, um, in my view, really helping out to to boost revenue, you know, tax tax collection, uh, in, you know, in in, in, the, in the economy. Now, um, with the threat of optimal strategy to reduce the impact of public debt, I mean, uh, it's very clear, and government has realized that. Yeah, sure. Thank you very much. These are very interesting questions, definitely, that have been uh, asked here. And uh, I'm, uh, I'm sure, of course, the the issues are similar, just as Professor Adiola was saying, that there's a, there's a lot of tax um, evasion, a tax avoidance uh, by the elite, by the highest bracket, and that needs to be countered for. Um, however, definitely digitization is uh, on the mandate of the current government and um, they have uh, this policy to digitize the whole uh, uh, government machinery. And um, there is a special section in the prime minister office that is uh, working on uh, the digitization of the government sector um, and uh, making it paper free. Um, I would say definitely it would be a great measure and it would uh, result in increasing uh, the tax base. Um, uh, absolutely, it would. Uh, and uh, I hope that we can do it as soon as possible because uh, the government, uh, because the next question is really important that the impact of public debt uh, that has been incurred uh, during COVID-19. So we need more of the tax uh, revenue coming in and uh, Optimal strategy, of course, um, it would differ um, from uh, for for each province. But I would say that uh, the current government is trying uh, to, as I said earlier, that we are under the uh, structural adjustment program of the International Monetary Fund. Uh, so it has been um, observed that they are thinking of um, the. It's not been implemented yet, but they are actually introducing. Um, a lower, uh, so there are brackets for the direct taxation, right? So we we are, we are in the process of introducing, um, uh, reducing the brackets. So even uh, someone with a lesser income would uh, have to fall in that bracket and pay um, a direct taxes now, which of course will hit uh, the uh, uh, lowest of the brackets. But uh, so let's say if the bracket started from uh, someone who is earning 400,000 a year, it will now start from uh, someone who is starting, who's earning 300,000 per year. So you lower the uh, bracket in order to include more uh, uh, population in the direct taxation um, net. So I would say that is one, uh, that is on the cards of the government. Apart from that, the government has um, also hinted at increasing electricity prices. So, of course, the reduction which was seen uh, in during COVID times is now uh, on the rise because there is a uh, high inflation and recession time going on and government needs uh, to finance um, uh, its uh, debt as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Saira. Thank you very much, Adiola. 
actually we are we are we are on time uh, uh, I, I would like to thank you for your insightful comments uh, also the audience for 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 being engaged and, and, and for for asking very very good questions I would also like to thank uh, Marjorie and Jenny and all pep for organizing the event uh, I would like to thank the interpreters and, uh, and special thanks to the IDRC for all the support to conduct the research through this core project. Thank you very much.